The State Historical Society of North Dakota presents Visions from the Past. So, did anybody, anybody ever hear of a place called Buford? Uh, an old frontier fort, Fort Buford? Anybody? This is Fort Buford. What do you mean? This Buford is nothing here. I mean, a powder magazine and a, and a, and a revamped officer's house don't make a fort. When we were transferred, transferred from Buford, there were 100 buildings there. If this is Buford, there should be three more of these officers' houses north of here. And then 50 feet out here about, there should be another row of officers' houses. About five in that row. And then, well, maybe another, well, across, across the parade ground, another 100 yards or so, just on the other side of the road, and that's where our four barracks should be. You sure this is the place? Well, in, in some ways, maybe it could be. I... Okay, that's Union up there. It didn't look like that in 66, I'll tell you. Now, the river's way up from where it was then, but uh, the river was always cutting new channels. See, this is Buford. When we were here, the river came up to about that second line of trees. Not this first one, but that second line of trees back there. Yeah, well, the, the bluffs look right. The bluffs look right. Yeah, and the railroad for it came through in 78, you know. But, but the buildings, what happened to all the buildings? When we were transferred in, 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 in 95, you know, just south of this building, that was the telegraph office. Then there was the adjutant's office below that. And then down toward the river, there were the warehouses and, and, and commissary uh, of, uh, places. Now, below our, our barracks, that's where the non-commissioner's office buried, a little farther east. And then straight out here, another, say, 100, 200 yards past our barracks, that's where the cavalry barracks were, and the stables, way out there. And the hospital, hospital's up at the end of our of our line of barracks. About where that, see where the, where the corner of that fence is, about where the, where the road turns, that's where the hospital was. Dead house was up there too. What? I mean, you'd think there'd be something left. Well, I'll tell you what happened. You know, what's the matter with you people? Couldn't you say it, any of it? Yeah, I'll tell you what happened. You know, either you or your grandparents or your great-grandparents just came in here. Maybe they bought some stuff, but they just lugged it off. They took off most of it. That's probably what happened. Well, they could have left, see, they could have left a little of it there. Yeah, you like that? Uniform, huh? Yeah, looks funny. Yeah, well, I agree. See, this is not the uniform I wanted to wear to come here in. I wanted to wear the one we wore when we got transferred, the new issue. I mean, this is the Civil War uniform I wore when I got here. I'll tell you this, they've, they've been issuing this surplus Civil War equipment to frontier, for, uh, frontier forces up into the 18, up into the 1880s. Did you end up on the frontier? Well, I, well I'll tell you what happened. See, I, I was in the Civil War, right? So I figured, I mean, you can tell I was a Yankee, right, by the blue? So I figured that if I survived the Civil War, I, I ought to be able to survive these frontier wars. I'll tell you this, after that first winter in Buford, <laughs> I wasn't so sure I figured right. Yeah, that first year. See, that first year, 1866, we built the first Fort Buford right here. Yeah, on, on, on June 15th, we came down, under Colonel Rankin, we came down to Fort Union and, and started. Now, there were, there were three officers, three officers, 89 men, oh, some civilian advisors. And then we started. We started cutting cottonwoods, and we made planks, and, and we nailed them, and we dug posts, hundreds of posts, dug hundreds of posts. And by, by June 22nd, just a week after that, we already had, well, we had a, a sawmill going down by the river, and we dug a, a 35-foot well. Now, let me tell you what we did in four months. In four months, we had built a 360 by 360-foot stockade right out here. Started about 50 feet out, and it was a funny angle angled up this way, back there, then across the road, and then back to this point. <laughs> and inside, we had the, um, well, the officers' quarters, civilian quarters, soldiers' barracks, a warehouse, bathhouses. And then, by November, we added to that, we added a blacksmith shop, a carpenter shop, um, uh, an underground cellar, a storage cellar. And on the outside, we had built the bottom two floors of the two bastions. Uh, See, a bastion's like a, like a blockhouse. 
And then the second floor, the southwest bastion, was used as the guardhouse. And just, just a few, few yards out here, that's where the southwest, uh, the southwest corner was. See, that was the bastion. Now, see, that's not all. Then, we also carried, hauled about 80 ton of hay, and outside the stockade, we built a cattle corral, that's down, down toward the river, a cattle corral, a woodshed, and then down by, right next to where the, where the sawmill was, we built the ice house. Yeah, not too bad, huh? Well, lucky we were ready, because to tell the Indians were. On uh, January, no, on November 23rd, some Adatsas told us that, that there were about 11 war parties of Sioux, some of them led by Sitting Bull, camped over there on the other side of the Missouri. Well, they, the first raid on the sawmill down there, but they withdrew. Then the next night, they broke into the sawmill, took some tools, and withdrew again. Then, on, on December 23rd, led by Sitting Bull, they came back and they took over the sawmill and the ice house. Well, they, they, used, the, they used the blade of the saw for a drum and they danced and sang, well, that was all right. But when they fired on the fort, Ah, then, then Colonel Rankin, you know, fired our two 12-pounders at him and drove him off. Well, he came back one more time, Christmas Eve. And that time, it took the 12-pounders several hours to, to drive him off. Yeah, well, there were, there were a lot of those raids were led, were led by Sitting Bull. See, that was the kind of, that was the kind of evening fighting we did mostly here at Buford. Uh, you know, stopping hit-and-run fights uh, on, on work parties like that and helping damn fool citizens who went out without protection. You know, one February noon, 1867, the Indians attacked two miners coming down from Fort Buford, from, from Fort Union down to Buford. Well, his friend made it, but Thomas Ward was so full of holes by the time we reached him, he died. He died the next day. Well, he's buried out there in the cemetery. Yeah, those war parties, mostly Sioux, they really stayed in close. You know, even in those days, even that early, yeah, it was getting pretty clear that Buford was going to be a, a supply base because, because this was where the, the Yellowstone and the Missouri joined. And all, most of the Indian fighting then was taking place farther west. Well, as the Indian fighting increased, then Buford got bigger too. In 1872, we had about five companies here. And with, with the left, that's over 200 men and with the buildings to go with it. And you can believe it, with all that, with all that building, and with that many men, we still didn't get decent barracks till 1878, huh? Nice building, huh? Well, the officers did all right. But our, our barracks were awful. Well, to start with, they were mostly adobe. And all that is, is sand, gravel, you know, chopped up hay or grass, cow manure, and water, made into a kind of a, a brick-shaped mud pie baked in the sun and used as a brick to build a house or, in our case, barracks. See, that was bad enough. But listen to this. In 1875, Dr. Middleton was sent out here to make an inspection. Here's what he said. See, the post is in excellent sanitary condition with the exception of the men's quarters. The absence of ventilation under the floors and the crumbling state of the walls render the men are unsuitable for soldiers to live in. The accumulation of filth under the floor from the date of their construction, 1867, to the present time, eight years, must be very considerable. And it was, believe me. The effluvium, nice word for stink, the effluvium arising from this, combined with the exhalation from the bodies of the men and the large amount of carbonic acid constantly present in the dormitories at night, together with the insufficient cubic space and defective ventilation can hardly fail to exert injurious effects. It did, that's what we lived in, till 1878. Well, like I said, you know, Buford was, was quickly becoming a supply base because of where we were located. Now, most of our supplies came to us up the river from Bismarck, by, by the river. Uh, and then we sent them on up to Missouri and, 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 the, and the Yellowstone to wherever, wherever the trouble was. See, most of the supplies were sent by water because it was cheaper and safer and faster. And in those days, in the, in the 70s and 80s, there were a, a lot of these mountain boats out here on the river. Uh, well, I remember seeing, you know, tied up down at our, at our landings, four or five at one time. Now, everybody knows about the, about the Far West because that's the boat that brought the news and the wounded down to the Custer Battle. But there were a lot more. There were the Dupree and the, and the Josephine and, and, and the Graham and the, uh, 
the Sheridan, uh, the Rosebud, the Elliston, just to name a few. Now see, but you could only you could only only ship on them. When the water was high. And that usually was from about the middle of April when the ice went out until the end of July, the middle of August, and it rained a lot that year. See, the other time, uh -huh. Now most of those supplies went, here's where they went. They went up the Yellowstone, all this most, because most was up the Yellowstone toward the, toward the Big Horn. Went up the Yellowstone toward the Tongue River Control, that's where Miles City is, or the uh, Glendive Depot, it wasn't that big, but the Tongue but the Depot was Glendive, and then later in Fort Field, that was at Miles City, and Fort, uh, Fort Custer, that was at Hardin, Montana. So they went up there. You know, in, in 16, in 1867, over 8,000 tons of supplies went up the river. But the rest of the year, you know, that was about seven or eight months. If any of you had supplies you had to move, they had to move by wagon train, so there were a lot of those. Well, on September 28th, 1867, a wagon train of 30 wagons left out of Buford, heading for the Powder River Control, and that's up the Yellowstone too, to where Terry, Montana is now, with 84,000 pounds of supplies from General Miles. You know, people, people ask me sometimes, what did you do in a place like Buford when, when you went out in the field and, and, and campaigning? Well, mostly you did what you were told. You had a little free time, but mostly you did what you were told. And that was follow the Army, the army uh, uh, regulations. You see, the colonel gave the orders, and the captain was the captain of each company was the one who was supposed to carry them out. But practically, it was usually the first sergeant who did it. Yeah, let me let me let me show you this. See, I got a letter from a friend who was made first sergeant and, and telling me what his job was and what he had to do with it if I didn't know. But it might interest you. Now he didn't sound like he was bragging, but then he was proud, so you know, you don't forgive him for that. He said, Dear Ray, I'm in full charge. What I say is it was backed up by the captain. There are uh, six duty sergeants and four corporals, all subject to my orders. I have a room myself, I get the time to the men, I call the roll three times a day, reveille, retreat, tattoo, I draw all the rations and clothing, I make out the guard details, have all the men clean and presentable for Sunday inspection, make out all the orders for detached service, visit the sick and wounded in the hospital. Yeah, so he had a room to himself. And I tell you, we enlisted men over there in those barracks, didn't we? We lived in one big room, uh, top, lower bunk, to two, sometimes three men. That ended in 1870. We were each in one place. You can believe that everybody, you know, all you can do is get to be in the place. You can get to be in the place. Some of the men had buffalo robes. Now, that was the soldier to get to have as a bunkie. Uh, you enlisted for, for five years. You got paid $13 a month, collectible every two months if the traveling paymaster got through. Not much money, huh? Let me tell you this. Whenever these riverboats tied up down here, I mean, the men used to board because, see, we heard, we heard that the crews on the boats, roosters, they called them, the young guys, just like we were, got paid forty, fifty dollars a month, probably less, and they weren't bored have to, you know, they weren't bored having to stay in one place all the time. They started to do it. Yeah, but Don, and it never worked. It did blue signal, and Captain was called. Sergeants and, and, and drill and, and fatigues and, and stables and meals and, re and retreat and assembly and everything. And then at about well in the evening, then a few taps for lights out. That was well, that was candles out and, and lamps out in those days. And that was about 9:30. I had three meals a day. Now well, some some companies had a food. Rotated every man in the company to cook ten days at a time. Whether he never cooked before in his life, sometimes you nearly died till he learned how to cook. Um, breakfast was a big meal. You have maybe slum gully, and that's beef stew or or baked hash, uh, something like that. At noon you had dinner. Now dinner was the biggest meal of the day. For that you might have roast beef and potatoes and vegetables if we had it. Vegetables would be maybe cabbage or onions or turnips, something like that. Now in the summer we grew our own vegetables down there toward, toward the river. Supper was at six o'clock and supper wasn't much. I uh, might have stewed fruit or, or leftovers or soup. 
and you had bread and coffee, bread and coffee with every meal. All the time you had bread and coffee. And I tell you this, now if you had, if you were lucky and you had a good staff sergeant who could really handle the company food money, yeah, you might be lucky and you might have canned fruit or you might have pickles or you might have something like this. Yeah, that's right. We had Worcestershire sauce in those days, different bottle, but same name, same name and uh, same taste. You know, I used to love it because the food, yeah, a lot of times was pretty flat and, you know, a little Worcestershire perked it up a little. Everybody was assigned duties. You know, you, you had guard duty, you took, a, took the turn, you had fatigue duties. Now, fatigue duties, all that was was just jobs that had to be done around the post. There'd be, uh, well, you might have to show snow or repair the barracks. That's what we did all the time. Carry wood, carry and carry water from, from the river, jobs like that. And sometimes, if you were lucky, you got, you got assigned something a little more interesting. See, one time I was assigned to building mounds. Now, hard work but it got you off the post a few days now what the mounds were is they were just uh, well piles of stone eight ten feet high set up to show the, the mail carrier the route along the river and i see you filled them on the high point so he could see from one mound to the next and then coming west that is coming up the river the, the mail the mail carrier would keep the river on his left and the mounds on his right you know the farmers nowadays call them johnnies there's still a few of them east of east of Williston. Another time I got assigned to uh, putting the stone that marked the corner of Buford, the Buford uh, Reservation. That was in 1874. Remember, the Buford Reservation was 30 miles by 30 miles, big place. Now, those first markers were just stones. Then later, what they did, they got big six-foot cast iron posts at each corner. Now somebody told me that they got one of those, they got one of those in the uh, in the center here. Take a look if you get a chance. Now at night, if you had no duty, that was your free time. See, you could, well, there might be a program, or there might be a party, or, or, or dance. Yeah, the laundresses would come, or, or the civilian women on the post might come. Or you could play cards, gamble, a lot of gamble. Pharaoh and Ben Ben Monty with a little paper. You could do that, or you could read. Oh, we had a, had a big library. Just at the end of the, of the second row of, of officers' houses. One time we had over 300 books in the post library. Or what you could do, and what a lot of what a lot of men did, was just take a walk down to the post trader store. Okay. Buford had a big post trader store, and it was located to the west. So if you walk west from here, keep walking till you get to the area between where the Masonic Lodge was and the cemetery. That's where the post supper post trader store was. See, on the post trader store, you could buy all kinds of things if you had the money. I mean, you could buy candy, you could buy licorice, you could buy tobacco, smoking or chewing tobacco, uh, cloth, thread, uh, luxuries like soap or, or canned fruit. Uh, now, the settler, we, we didn't call him that after about the 1880s, we called him the post trader. He let you charge. And many, many guys, nev, many men never, never got their bill paid. You know, and probably the most walking you did, except for drill and, 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 uh, and field service, was walking your dirty clothes down to your laundress. Every post, every post had an area for laundry that was called Suds Row. Now, all, at Buford, all the laundresses weren't in this one place, but most of them were. And where that was, was right straight down here, halfway between, well, halfway from here to the river. And see, it was a great thing the Army did. See, they set aside a certain amount of money for, uh, for laundresses to wash a soldier's clothes, his blanket, and his bed sack. There was one, one laundress for every 20 soldiers. Now, she got rations like we did, and every soldier paid her 70 cents a month for the washing she did. And sometimes the laundresses made more money than the soldiers did. And one time, one time, people had over 12 laundresses. You know, most of those women, or a lot of them anyhow, were married to older soldiers. And they were allowed to live down there. They're the family. And some of them even had children. And, you know, sometimes you, you see those kids and, you know, you get kind of homesick and, and, and depressed. See, depression gets. Give that up. Don't mess with depression. Because that's what one of the things that got a lot of soldiers drinking. And drinking was a problem on every post in the West. Uh, you know, lonesomeness did it and boredom. and Enlisted man officers, everybody had the problem. Let me tell you this. Before 1881, you could buy all the liquor you wanted in a post trader store. 
But after 1881, well, in that year, uh, Rutherford B. Hayes was elected president. He was kind of a teetotaler, and I don't know if he did it alone, but used his influence so that after 1881, you could only buy liquor from the post canteen. And that way, the army could regulate, they figured, how much you're going to drink. But that, that didn't solve the problem. I and mean, you could always get it. There are always ways to get liquor. Uh, so, you know, every night, somebody was being thrown into the, into the, into the guardhouse or the mill, as we called it, or being drunk or fighting or both. You know, the army had, well, serving time was one punish the army had, but, but they had a lot of other ones, too. And one of them, one of them was called carrying the law. And what that was, depending on what you did, you could be forced to carry a 40-pound log around all day or half a day without putting it down and without, without getting off your feet. Now, it may not sound too bad, but try it sometime. The field service could be hard, could be dangerous, and could be boring sometimes, too. But it was a change, so nearly everybody welcomed it. Uh, now, you wore, on the march, you wore the same people you only wore in the garrison, but you always wore your oldest one, because, I mean, uh, you know, scoria and gravel and thorns really were hard on clothes. Also, on the march, you carried your uh, 45 caliber single shot rifle with about 20, 20 rounds of ammunition at your belt. In your haversack, you carried your well, two or three days ration, uh, your, uh, your mess kit, uh, canteen that held about a quart of water, and then personal things like maybe a change of clothes and so forth. Over your shoulder, you carried your bedroll. All together, you carried about 50, 60 pounds of, I mean, of, of equipment put on, that, on that march. You'd break camp before dawn, three, sometimes four o'clock in the morning. Cook your breakfast and start. Now, a supply column would, would march about 20 miles a day. Uh, you'd stop every hour for a short, for a short rest, maybe five, 10 minutes. Uh, you know, just, just a little like that. Uh, then at noon, you'd stop for dinner. But dinner was no cooking. Dinner was usually hardtack. Then the march ended at three or four in the afternoon, so you could, you know, make camp and get wood and water and, and cook before it got dark. And see, your big cooking took place at night. And nearly every soldier cooked for himself. Uh, but you always cooked up some extra, uh, you know, sow belly or bacon for your hardtack for, for dinner the next day. You boiled your coffee in your heavy tin cup tw uh, twice a day, morning and night. But before you could boil your coffee, you had to roast your coffee beans in that tin cup. Because see, they issued coffee green, not, not roasted. Now, I don't know why. It's probably cheaper, but I don't know why. <laughs> i got to tell you about hardtack. We won the West on hardtack. Now, the Army called it hard bread, and we called it a lot of things, but some of the more respectable were, were flour tile, um, angle cake, worm casting. But all it was was just a rock-hard biscuit, unleavened, that is, had no soda to make it rise, made from, from wheat flour, salt, and water. Now, it came in different sizes, but usually it was about three and a half, by three, by three-eighths of an inch thick. I don't know what's wrong with this batch because it's breaking. I don't know if it's not supposed to do that. But that's what hardtack was look looked like. Now, there were ways you could make it make it better. If you, uh, you could crumble it up and cook it and add a little sugar and then fry it in your baking grease or sow belly, that was kush or, or hellfire. Or if you were lucky and rich and had condensed milk, yeah, we had condensed milk in those days, you could soak your brick in the condensed milk, sprinkle on some sugar, and bake it, and that was burgo. But usually what you did, you just took your hardtack, soaked it in your, in your sow belly grease or bacon grease, uh, sprinkled on some sugar if you were rich, packed it in your haversack for dinner next day, and prayed that somebody would shoot an antelope or it didn't get so hot the grease ran all over everything. Now the last big thing that happened July 19, 1881. That was the day Sitting Bull turned himself in. See, he turned himself in here at Buford. See, after, after the Custer battle, the military was chasing the Sioux, the Sioux and Cheyenne all over the West, trying to get them onto reservations. Well, most of them came in. That is, that they surrendered to live the reservation life. But not Sitting Bull. Uh, he didn't want to do that. He still wanted to live, live the old Indian way. So he and his followers fled into Canada. Uh, to live free. They could live free, but to starve because the buffalo were also, whatever were left, was still down in Montana. 
the Canadian government had agreed to let him stay there, but wouldn't feed him. So for about, well, five years, Sitting Bull and his followers tried to live, make, make a life out of that. And there were some negotiations and some skirmishes at the border, but nothing really happened till about 1880, 1881. And then Low King, or Crow King and Low Dog, two of Sitting Bull's biggest chiefs came in, turned themselves in right here with some of their followers. Then, in January of that same year, Chief Gall, certainly another of, of Sitting Bull's chief, uh, chief uh, leaders, turned himself in a pop popular just up a ways here and was brought to Beaufort. He was here about four months before he was sent on down to, to Bismarck. Then, in April of that year, over at, at, at Fort Keogh, about 146 Hunk Papa followers, that is Hunk Papa, those were the, the uh, Sitting Bull's people, turned themselves in over, surrendered over to Keogh. And then here, in Beaufort, in, in May of that year, Sitting Bull's own daughter turned herself in right here. And then the Sitting Bull saw the, you know, the writing on the wall, as we used to say, that, that his people were starving, his, his big leaders were leaving him, so what could he do? So what he did, he sent word in that he was coming. So on, Gen, on, 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 uh, on July 19th, Before noon, Colonel Walter Clifford took five men, seven wagons, and went out to meet Sitting Bull and his people. Now, I wasn't here that day, so I don't really know exactly what happened. Where they probably came in. They probably came in what we call what we call the Fort Peck Trail. That was a trail that went northwest out of Beaufort to Fort Peck. While we're here, though, we, they did. They camped down about halfway from here to the river. Camped down in that area. They weren't here long, only about 10 days, but by the time they were here, they camped there. There were about 100, well, 187. Uh, 37 of them were warriors, and the less were women and children and uh, old men, women and children. You know, I've often wondered, how do you think he must have felt? Maybe he didn't, maybe he didn't, he didn't think this way, but how he must have felt, thinking back, coming back here, thinking back when he was a young chief, that first year, fighting us here and expecting to drive us off, and now it was all over. You know, too bad all around, because he and, and, and Crazy Horse and, and Chief Joseph were great men a lot of ways. See, I claim that when Sitting Bull came in, that was the end of the Sioux Cheyenne River, because uh, not, not, the, not the massacre at Wounded Knee, because when the, when the chiefs were all gone, what could the Indians do? Well, Buford kept going for another 15 years, but not so much like a military post anymore. Uh, you see, no more Indian troubles, but on all this surrounding land around here, there was hardly any civil government yet. So, but there were a lot of highwaymen out there and cattle thieves and that sort of stuff. So what we did, we really were, acted like a police force for a while. And we, we protected the construction of the and, uh, uh, you know, trouble, troubles there. And then, 1894, we joined the Pullman strike on the side of the railroad, protecting the bridges and, and, and railroad property around here. Then, 1895, General Brooke came here, made an inspection, and he said in his report that except for the officers' houses and the hospital, all the buildings on Beaufort were in such bad shape they weren't even worth repairing. And also, they didn't think they didn't work like this anymore. So his recommendation was, as of September 6th, 1895, Beaufort should be abandoned. So, well, there were there were four companies left, four infantry companies and four uh, cavalry companies, and they were all transferred into Montana. So, after 29 years, that was the end of Fort Beaufort. Huh. 29 years, but more than a lifetime to some people. Too bad there's not a little more left. Now, I, I gotta apologize to you people for we're getting mad at you for not saving anything. It wasn't your fault. You know, but I wish you could have seen it. So about 1880, it really looked nice. Even our barracks looked nice. And you know, the officers' rows, ah, they always look nice. You know, I heard that, well, the, a, lot of these, a lot of these officers' houses were bought, and that there are eight of them around here still being used. So maybe you can get some of them back. Well, I'm glad I came to take a look. And you know, I feel better, feel better about having come because you people aren't going to forget us. I mean, you're putting all our stuff together in here, all you can get a hold of. You know, 
we should have thought that maybe maybe you'd want to want some of that stuff and then kept it but eh, in those days we didn't think we we just took things as they came we didn't think ahead much didn't think back much so well too bad we didn't i better shut up and get out of here i'm gonna miss my ride so been nice talking to you well so now it's time for all the adioses and goodbyes and so long i'll be seeing you people sometimes you say uh Take care, right? That's sort of a goodbye. Take care. Well, I saw here. I don't know what you do, but I hear it being done. So I want to say, take care. I'll see you again. Goodbye. The State Historical Society of North Dakota is housed in the North Dakota Heritage Center on the Capitol grounds in Bismarck. For more information about these programs or the State Historical Society of North Dakota, please contact the Education and Interpretation Division, North Dakota Heritage Center, Bismarck, North Dakota, 58505, or call 701-224-2799.